my name is Marge Gustoviak and I'm a nurse and I've been asked to speak to you today on communication. Communication begins at birth. We cry when we're hungry and we need to be fed. We cry when we're wet and we need to be changed. And we cry when we're lonely and want to be held up. This is pretty simple, but it gets a little more complicated as we go on in life. Communication, in my opinion, is the number one reason that problems exist at home, at school, and in our work relationships. It is one of the most valued traits of most employees, yet it's the least taught. But you're in luck today because this video series has chosen to include communication as one of its tasks. To review what we'll be going over today, there's four basic areas. First, we'll take a look at the four components or pieces that make up every communication. Next, we'll go into the two different types of communication. Thirdly, we'll go into the four different styles of communication, and we're going to end up with tips on listening. We'll get started with the components or pieces of communication. There are four. The first piece is the sender. This is the person giving the message. In the case of our video series today, I'm considered the sender. The second piece is the message, and that's the image, feeling, or idea that's being conveyed. In the example right now, tips on communication is what's considered the message. The third piece is the receiver, and this is the person that's getting the me message. Given our situation again today, you would be considered the receiver. And finally is the feedback, and this is the reaction to the message. And to me, this is one of the most critical pieces of the communication components. In our example today, things you would share with people, either what you liked or didn't like or believe or didn't believe, would be the feedback to our communication taking place. These four components take place in all communication. Understanding this is one of the keys in good communication skills. Next, we'll go into two types of communication. This is verbal and nonverbal. Verbal is spoken or written. It includes talking, telephone conversations, letters, emails, and written reports. Some hints for good verbal communication is to always introduce yourself and make sure the person understands what you're about to do. Choose meaningful words. Never use slang, swearing, or gossip. Speak clearly and distinctly. We're going to be taking a look at a communication that takes place with Mary Lou, who you'll see in a flower top, and Kathy, who's wearing a vest. Mary Lou needs Kathy to clean her room. So let's see if she's chosen her words carefully and that Kathy's clear on what she really wants done. Let's take a look. Kathy, could you stop what you're doing, please? What? I just walked past Mrs. Gregg's room and it is a mess. So? So, could you please clean it up? Why can't you do it? Because I'm the manager and managers don't clean up rooms. Well, just because you're the manager doesn't mean that you can't clean it up. Kathy, you know that's your job. Please go do it. And if you don't like it, then punch out. I'm busy preparing the meals. I don't have time to clean up her room. You do it. Just go do it. Fine. I don't think that's probably what either one of them wanted in conclusion to that communication. Mary Lou is going to be a little more careful now on how she approaches Kathy and the types of words that she uses and how she explains what she needs to have done. So let's see if we can't come up with a better conclusion this time. Let's take a look. Kathy, can you stop what you're doing, please? What? I just went past Mrs. Gregg's room, and she's having company tonight, and the room is a mess. It needs to be cleaned up. So you do it. Well, I can't do it because I have to pass the medications. Well, I'm trying to prepare all the meals. Well, why don't you finish preparing the meals, I'll finish the medications, and then we'll clean the room together. Okay, so you want me to pass the meals first, and then you'll work with me and we'll clean our room together. We'll do it together. Okay, that sounds good to me. Okay. 
I think you'll agree with me that that was a much better conclusion. You may also be involved in some written reports in your work. Now we're going to take a look in on Betty, who's a supervisor, and she's reviewing the report from the night before. Listen to what the report has in it and pay attention if there is some blaming that was taking place or some gossip that might have been introduced. Let's listen in on Betty's report. Let's see what's in the report for me today. This place looks like a pigsty when I came on. I heard Sarah was out late drinking. Sarah's a messy worker and we always have to pick up after her. She never gets her work done. When are you going to do something about this? Now I think Betty got a message with that report, but I think it might be a little colored by some of the gossip and some of the blaming that took place. Let's take a look at that very same report that's written differently, taking away the blaming and the gossip, and think what kind of message Betty got this time. Let me see what's in the report for me today. This unit was a real mess when we came on. Clothes were not put away, the dining room tables was not washed, the garbage was overflowing. Let's discuss this. Betty, can we talk about this? I think that's a good idea. Now Betty got the same information, but the gossip and the blaming was taken out of it. I think she'll be able to approach this by addressing the problem rather than attacking the person and probably get some better results. Now the next area we're going into is nonverbal communication. Nonverbal communication includes gestures, have welcoming people, being closed off to people. It includes posture and body movement. It includes touch. You can have a gentle touch or you can have a firm touch. I need you to pay attention here. Eye contact is considered nonverbal communication. Silence, when you're wanting people to pay attention. And size. We're going to take a look at Betty on the telephone. Sarah's calling in, and I want you to pay attention to what Betty's body language is telling you about Betty's reaction to this phone call. Fourth floor, Betty Hoxine nurse. May I help you? Yes, Sarah. You're calling in. You realize that. It's already 3 o'clock and you're calling in at 3? Yes, Sarah? Do you have a headache? Well, Sarah, consider this a verbal warning. I know you have a headache, but you have to give us amount of time for a call in. Okay, Sarah, but this is a verbal warning. Goodbye, Sarah. Could you tell that Betty was a little upset with that call? We're going to take a look at that same call now, and Betty's going to be showing a little more compassion, and look for her tone of voice and her gesturing and her lack of size, and see how that makes a difference in how that message is received. Fourth floor, Betty Hotsign Nurse. Yes, Sarah. You're calling in? You don't feel well? Oh, that's too bad, Sarah. Well, you did call in enough time. I can get a replacement for you. Oh, okay, Sarah. I hope you feel better. Bye-bye. Before we leave this section on nonverbal communication, I want to share with you three facts that I find astounding. Our body language communicates 55% of our communication. So how we're holding our position is going to tell people 55% of what we're intending to communicate to them. Our tone of voice accounts for 38% of our communication. So if we're angry and we have body language that shows that and our voice becomes sharp and more stern, that's going to communicate a message to that person. Now your actual words make up only 7% of the communication. So while it's important that you carefully choose your words, as you can see, it's even more important that your body language and tone of voice go with those carefully chosen words. Because with body language and tone of voice, that's giving that message 93%. 
This is an astounding fact, one that's very important to, for you to remember when you think miscommunication is taking place. We're going to go now to the four communication styles. Three of these communication styles don't work well at all and will guarantee to get us into trouble. And one of the communication styles is the one that works. So we're going to take a look at the same situation using the four different communication styles. In this scenario, two employees are concerned about call lights getting answered. Mary Lou in the flowered blouse has a concern that she's doing most of the answering of the call lights. And Kathy in the vest has a concern that she's answering most of the call lights. So let's take a look at the passive style first. Mary Lou continually takes in what Kathy has to tell her and she obediently goes about and does what Kathy tells her to do. Now this is passive because Mary Lou is getting frustrated with Kathy. She's thinking that she's doing most of the call lights. But pay attention and see if Kathy's getting this idea with Mary Lou's passive style of communication. Let's take a look at that now. Mary Lou, can you get that call light? Well, I suppose I could get this one too. What's another call light? Well, I've gotten a lot of them this afternoon. You haven't really taken that many call lights. Well, as long as I'm going down the hall, is there anything else you'd like me to do? Well, now that you mention it, there's a bathroom on the end of the hall that's really messy. If you could kind of clean that up a little when you go down there, it'd be greatly appreciated. All right. Now, do you think Kathy has any idea how disgusted Mary Lou is getting with the work situation? Mary Lou probably will remain disgusted, and if she stays in that passive communication style, she's going to choose to go work somewhere else. But she's going to find herself in that same situation unless she changes her communication style. Now, the next communication style we're going to look at is aggressive. And you can tell an aggressive communication style because there's somebody attacking and someone defending. After that person defends themselves, they attack back. So you'll say, well, you don't do this. Oh, yeah, well, I do too, but you don't do this. I think we can clearly see the aggressive style in this next example. Mary Lou, can you get the call light? I'm sick of getting all the call lights. You haven't been getting call lights at all this afternoon. I've been doing all the work. How can you say that you're doing all the work? You're just sitting here. I've been sitting here until a call light goes off and I'm getting up and I'm taking care of it. Well, you've just been sitting there all the way through. You don't do anything. I don't think that's fair for you to say that I don't do anything because I do. Fine. I'll get the manager and have them settle it. You just go ahead and do that and I'll talk to her too and let her know how much you actually do. Fine. I think they're so busy deciding who's the worst person that they'll never get that call light answered. Let's look at a third example, which is called passive aggressive. And this is where you give one set of impression to a person and then you turn around and attack them later. In this scenario, Betty's going to be entering in on the scene and she's going to be asking for a report to be filled out. Now, Kathy's going to be very nice to her face, but when she leaves, she's going to start attacking her. This work situation will continue to go on unless their communication style changes. But let's take a look right now at what the passive-aggressive communication style looks like. Here's some documents you're supposed to sign and date. Nice outfit, Betty. Thank you, Kathy. Oh, you're looking really good. Well, thank you. Um, there's a call light. Do you think you could get it? Sure. My God, she is the laziest person I know. I'm telling you, you got to tell her to do every little thing that there is to be done. She won't do it on her own. Nothing. I'm sick of working with her. She's the only person that I know that I have to constantly tell, get the call light, Betty, get the call light, Betty. Everyone else at least hears it and takes care of it. Some people. Oh, I know. At least there's us. We're the hardest workers there are. That's true. You can see how the passive-aggressive can lead into gossip and how this feeds off of each other, and that problem's still not going to be taken care of. 
Now, you're going to be exposed to all of those communication styles, but I'd like to have you take a look at what I consider the best communication style. And that's the assertive technique. And this works because it focuses on the issue. So you get away from that pointing your finger and blaming or, or being afraid to say what you feel. So let's take a look at this in action and see that how it can make a difference. Mary Lou, could you get the call light? Oh, Kathy, I've gotten so many call lights today. Can't you just get it? I've been getting just as many as you've been getting today. Oh, we got to do something about this. Well, what about if we meet over breakfast in the morning and try to work it out so that we're both getting an equal amount of call lights and that things are working out good for the resident? I like that idea. Okay, how about I meet you at 7 for breakfast? Sounds good. Okay. Now, I've had people look at this and say, yeah, like that's ever going to happen. But if you remember, you have control over how you respond. And if you use this approach and use the assertive style of communication, you're going to find that same success. Finally, we're going to address listening. First of all, let's consider why we want to become an active listener. Well, one reason is that people can free themselves of troublesome feelings when they're encouraged to express them openly. The best example I can think of is when you've lost someone that's close to you and you find yourself crying or you find yourself hurting. If someone's interested and wants to listen to you, you'll find yourself able to express what's painful to you in the loss of that person and you begin to heal this way. So that's one good reason to be an active listener. Another reason is that it promotes a relationship of warmth between the speaker and the listener. If you know I have an interest in what you have to say, you're going to connect with me and you're going to feel that I'm a caring person. A third reason is that it helps with problem solving. If I'm listening to you and encouraging you to express yourself, you're going to find that you're going to come up with different solutions to problems. A fourth reason is that it encourages a mutual concern. The person will be more willing to listen to your thoughts and feelings. I'm interested in you, you're interested in me. And pretty soon we're working together to solve problems. The fifth reason is that it'll keep the ownership of the issue with the person. This is your issue, I'm willing to listen to you, but I need to keep focusing and back on you so that you begin to deal with it. And finally, an empathetic understanding can bring about positive changes. Now, what does this mean? This means that I'm with you, I'm understanding what you have to say, and I care very much about it. And although it's still your issue, you know you've got a friend and a good listener so that you can bring about those changes. Now, you have to have a special attitude when you're listening to someone, and these are very important. Number one, you must really want to hear what's being said. If you're talking to me and I'm, you know, busy checking my date book, that's not going to let you know that I care about what you have to say. You must also want to be helpful, and this will show in your response. You communicate something to me, and if I want to be helpful, you'll hear that in my voice in the way I listen to what you say. Thirdly, you must be able to accept feelings. We may not feel the same way about something, but as a listener, it's important that I put my feelings aside because what's important in listening is what you're conveying. Number four is believe that that person has the capacity to handle their problem. I'm not going to jump in and give you solutions or jump in and give you my experience because it's your issue and I'm the listener in this role. One good thing, number five, is that feelings are not permanent. And I think the best example is disasters in our life, where we're sure the world is going to end and we can't believe, you know, how unjust life is to us. But then years later, we're able to express it and it's funny and we laugh about it. So that's the good thing, that feelings can change, they're not permanent. Number six is accept that it's very difficult to listen when you're talking. There's no way you're going to believe that I'm caring about what you have to say if I keep interrupting and giving you my viewpoint. And lastly, it's important to listen to understand and not to reply. 
I can't be thinking of what I want to say, how I want to interject my experience. I have to listen to understand. So questions I ask are going to open up a better understanding of the communication that's taking place. Now we're going to look at three scenarios. The first is Betty is going to be going to Kathy. She has a trip plan and she needs to verify and make sure that she's got that time off. Kathy isn't using the best of listening skills. In fact, she seems to be pretty preoccupied with something else. But let's take a look at what that looks like. Hi, Betty. Did you want to talk to me about something? Yes, Kathy. I put in my uh, six months request because you know I'm going to Puerto Vallarta and I have to. Kathy? Yeah, I'm listening, Betty. I'm just getting a pen. Because I have my tickets, my air flight, and everything is all set, but I need the okay from you because I have to have somebody to replace me. And I put it in, Kathy. Yeah, I'm just, I'm getting it, Betty. I got it all. Just keep going. I'm, I hear you. Because we got to go down to the International Airport in Laquita, Illinois, to, to book Kathy. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Betty. Go ahead. I, I'm just trying to get it. I'm getting it all down. Okay, because I have to let my husband and my kids know because he's got his time off, and I don't have mine off, Kathy. But, Kathy, I don't think you're listening to me. I'm listening to you. Well, Kathy, I have not got a reply, and I need a reply, Kathy, because I'm going to have to have a reply soon. If I don't, I'm going to have to take the trip anyway, Kathy, and then I don't want to be in trouble when I get back. Kathy, you're not listening to me. Now, it's quite obvious that Betty knew Kathy wasn't listening to her. She didn't get an answer, and Betty was pretty frustrated at the end. Now we're going to look at Kathy being anxious to give her opinion, and you can see how this affects the communication. Hi, Betty. Come on in. Is there something that you wanted to talk to me about? Yes, Kathy. I need some time off. I'm going to Puerto Vallarta. Oh, I went to Puerto Vallarta. Oh, I loved it. Oh, the kid. Oh, there's so many kids there, and they want to give you. They want. But Kathy, I need the reply right away because I have to get back to March. My travel agent. She's got to let me know. I've used her before. She is really good. She is one of the best travel agents. She'll make sure she takes care of you. But Kathy, what I came in here to talk to you about is that did you okay? the days off. You know, it, it's, it's really, it's getting kind of close. When are you leaving? I'm leaving, but Kathy, wait a minute. Um, I need those days off. I need a reply, Kathy, because I'm going to be leaving on the 16th. Oh, how are you leaving? Are you going through Chicago? Yes, I'm going through Chicago, Kathy. Oh, I but, love O'Hare Airport. But, that is the best airport. The but, flights are always on time. Oh, but that Kathy, is a great airport. I still need you to give me a reply. I can't fly to the uh, Port of Ottawa unless you know. You the me... last time I flew, we were we were delayed when we were leaving out of Atlanta, so they put us up in a hotel. Oh, it was so nice, and it was all paid for. Kathy, do I have the days off? In this case, I think Betty was doing as much listening as Kathy was. She was so eager to get her opinion in. And again, Betty still doesn't have an answer to her question. The last example we're going to look at is Kathy showing that she's an active listener, that she has those traits of wanting to understand what's being said and being helpful. And this time, I think Betty's going to get her answer. Let's look. Hi, Betty. You wanted to see me about a scheduling problem? Yes, uh, Kathy, I had put in a request six months ago because I'm going to Puerto Vallarta between the 16th and 23rd, and I haven't had a reply yet. So you said that you put it in six months ago, um, and you, you did put down the dates the 16th through the 23rd? Yes, I would like to know, is it okay? Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do some checking, and I can get back to you sometime today to let you know for sure whether or not that's going to be okay. That's great, Kathy. Thank you. I don't know about you, but I'm glad Betty's finally going to find out that she can take that vacation. In summary, we've covered the pieces that make up communication. We've covered the types of communication. We've covered four different communication styles that you'll be coming in contact with. And you've gotten some real good tips on listening. Now, I think it's important that you review this tape, you listen to it again, you talk about it with your coworkers, with your family, and try some of these techniques out.
If you master the skill of communication, you'll have discovered the key to a satisfying and productive relationship with your friends, at home, and in your workplace.